This is the final after three counts. Uh, Joe Biden wins Georgia by 11,779 votes. NBC News now calling President-elect Joe Biden the apparent winner in Georgia, and it's 16 electoral votes. It is only the third time in more than five decades that a Democrat or independent has won the state, which has been solidly Republican since 1972. Back in 2020, Georgia's voters made history when they elected Joe Biden as president by just over 11,000 votes. The last time a Democratic presidential candidate won Georgia's electoral votes was in 1992, when Bill Clinton, then the governor of Arkansas, secured a victory in the state over incumbent President George H.W. Bush. But Georgia was at the center of politics for more than its presidential sway in 2020. The Biden win we mentioned in Georgia is the first for a Democrat in 28 years. But tonight, Georgia remains at the center of the American political universe. Why? Because control of the United States Senate and quite possibly the fate of Mr. Biden's legislative agenda now rests on two races there heading for a January showdown. Here's Democratic candidates John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock also won historically red Senate seats by a narrow margin, signaling a shift in the Georgian voting power. The state saw an overall increase in voter registration and participation from 2016 to 2020, especially by Asian voters, who had a greater turnout than any other group of eligible voters, both nationwide and in Georgia. In this episode, we turn our focus to Indian American voters who are often overlooked when it comes to their political turnout and power. A 2022 report by Asian Americans Advancing Justice noted that Georgia's Asian population has increased by 52% to 480,000 people since the year 2010. And the state's 165,000 Indian Americans make up nearly a third of that total Asian population. As we look toward the 2024 election, the role of Indian American voters in Georgia is likely to be pivotal. As the 2024 election season unfolds, all eyes will be on Georgia, with Indian American voters playing a critical role in shaping the state and the nation's political future. Welcome back to Nation League. In this limited election series podcast by Immigrant League Media, we're going to discuss issues that matter to some of the most overlooked democratic groups in the US. As election season fast approaches, we will examine key moments which will paint a clear picture of what to expect come November. We are your host, Juan Diego Ramirez. And Sarah Sadwani. And this is Nation League. There are more than 165,000 Indian Americans in Georgia more than half reside in the state's largest metropolitan area, Atlanta. Most of the Indian communities that we see in Georgia today came after the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act, which removed immigration quotas based on nationality. This paved way for high-skilled and educated Indian immigrants through educational exchange programs, temporary visas, or employment-based pathways. For context, India's dot-com boom in the 1990s shifted the country's educational priorities to computer science and information technology. As demand for software engineers and IT professionals grew in the U.S., many Indian professionals who had become expert in these fast-growing fields were able to relocate their skills abroad. Some labeled the migration process as a brain drain from India to the U.S., considering that many of the new immigrant workers were already highly educated and skilled in their homelands. Now, the Indian population alone is the largest Asian population in the U.S. at 4.4 million and growing with each election cycle. But in states like Georgia, where over half of the population is white and a third is black, Asian individuals and their issues have often been siloed. Today, the Indian population, which includes Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, and more, are becoming part of the everyday life in Georgia. Sarah, with this context that I just gave, there was one line that stuck out to me. I understand that, for example, with Latinos, we are not a monolith, uh, but one thing that usually unites Latinos is Spanish language. So why are 
Indian Americans lumped together with East Asian Americans. Why is that? And why is it significant for understanding politics of Asian Americans? Yeah, that is such an important question, JD. And let me put on my professor hat here for a second, <laughs> you know, because there's a long sort of history of racial categorization in the United States. And there was a really important case uh, in front of the Supreme Court back in 1923. This is the United States versus Bhagat Singh Thind. Uh, and what they ultimately said is that Indians are not white and therefore cannot be citizens. And that was during a time period when citizenship laws were very different than they are today. And ultimately only white people could be US citizens. Fast forward. And so in the 1970s, the Office of Management Budget, which kind of helps to oversee the, the census, put out this directive that explicitly said that Indians should be categorized with Asians. And in part, that was seen as a move to continuously exclude Indians and make sure that everyone knows that Indians can't pass as white or something like that. Um, there's a long history on the South Asian um, subcontinent of people identifying with the, quote, Aryan race, if you will. That was how people were claiming whiteness amongst Indians in order to gain citizenship. And so despite this exclusion, you know, formally from the U.S. government, I think the categorization of Asians has been used as a political tool to try and empower a larger group of folks that have somewhat similar interests and issues as immigrants from Asia, we get the the stereotype of being the forever foreigners, of being the model minority, despite the fact that there's all sorts of issues that lie within the Asian sort of stereotype and subcategory. So that's kind of the history of, of how that came to be. You know, and, and one of the things that we often have to look at is the, the partisan identification of a group. Not, so not just the categorization of them uh, at all, but how they engage in politics. And more recently, we've seen some of these sensational political figureheads, like former presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy. My name is Vivek Ramaswamy. I'm running for U.S. president. I'm the first millennial ever to run for president as a Republican. And former South Carolina governor Nikki Haley. When I was governor, I passed one of the toughest illegal immigration laws in the country. Obama sued me over it which might indicate that the Indian American vote is beginning to sway to the right in some way. But that's actually not the case. A 2022 Asian American voter survey with AAPI data, which showed that 68% of Indian American voters would be inclined to vote for a Democratic candidate if the election was held today. Beyond backing Democrats at the polls, however, Indian Americans, who are among one of the most wealthy ethnic groups in the country, are also fundraising for Biden. Vinod Khosla, a prominent Indian American billionaire and venture capitalist, raised over a million dollars for Biden at a fundraising event, and he's the first Indian American to do so this 2024 election cycle. Historically, Indian American voters have been longtime supporters of the Democratic Party, and most really believe that this likely stems from President Clinton back in the 1990s, who made a historic trip to India, really solidifying the relationships between the United States and India, but also between Indians and the Democratic Party. Right. And Bill Clinton also raised the cap for the number of H-1B visas which Indian nationals benefited from during the early 2000s tech boom. And this reminds me, Sarah, so what makes Indian Americans the outlier of other Asian Americans that are lumped into this category of Asians in the U.S.? Yeah, you know, and, and this is why it has so many political outcomes, because even as you noted, right, the number of H-1B visas in particular, those are highly skilled visas. So that program allowed more Indians to come who were doctors, engineers, folks coming to Silicon Valley, 
that's quite different for other Asian Americans and for other immigrants as well, right? So if we think about folks from Southeast Asia, from Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, um, they were oftentimes coming as refugees after the wars that were taking place there. Um, Folks from China will often come sometimes on H-1Bs, sometimes as students, sometimes as family members as well. So there's a host of different pathways that bring people to the United States, but it turns out that those pathways are really significant. Indian Americans who are highly educated show up in the U.S. typically already speaking English, coming from the world's largest democracy where they've probably cast a vote in the past, which if you're, that's a really big difference if you're coming from from communist China, where you have a very different kind of relationship with the government. And all of that kind of matters. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the data that we've collected from AAPI data. 54% identify with the Democratic Party. And that is, again, it's higher than any other Asian ethnic group. If we compare that, for example, to Vietnamese Americans, Vietnamese Americans are far more conservative than Indian Americans. Amongst Chinese Americans, you'll see about a third identify with no party preference so that the larger majority of Chinese Americans don't say which party they want to engage with. We also find that certain issues matter more to Indian Americans. Uh, In surveys that we've conducted, 88% of Indian Americans will say that healthcare, education, the economy are all important or very important issues, even like gun control and the environment. They say nearly 80% of those surveyed will say are very important, and that is much higher than other ethnic groups. It does really set Indian Americans apart in this way from other Asian Americans. And so it's important then that we study Indian Americans, but that when it comes to elections, that campaigns are aware of that difference and go and campaign directly to them, right, to, to use culturally competent means of actually trying to mobilize that vote and gain and earn the support of Indian American voters. of Indian Americans hold a favorable view of Joe Biden and at the same time have a really favorable view and a lot of love for the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi. He is beloved by a fairly large majority of Indian Americans. So many people really love the fact that he has worked to build infrastructure. He has this sort of larger than life personality in many ways, and at the same time has been incredibly aggressive towards the Muslim population in India itself, much like the way that Trump has been aggressive toward immigrant communities here in the United States. So it's a really interesting juxtaposition between the two. And so all of this is coming at a time when Indian American advocates have expressed a growing need for more political representation. Uh, Indian political voices have grown exponentially within the last decade. You know, we now have a vice president, Kamala Devi Harris, who is Indian American, and congressional leaders who, and they use this term, not me, the Samosa Caucus. I'm told that the Samosa Caucus In now the flavor of the house. <laughs> um, includes folks like Rokana, Ami Vera from California, Pramila Jayapal, Raja Krishnamurthy, and the newest member, Sri Tanadar from Michigan. And they're all at the decision-making tables in Washington, D.C. And even on the Republican side with Vivek Ramaswamy and Nikki Haley, they are Indian American are, and are putting Indian Americans into the spotlight of national politics. Ann Coulter, the Republican political commentarist, uh, appeared as a guest on Vivek Ramaswamy's podcast recently, and she voiced how she will not vote for him because Indian people don't represent, quote, American WASP values. Oh, and I agreed with many, many things you said during, in fact, probably more than than most other candidates um, when you were running for president, but I still would not have voted for you um, because you're an Indian. We'll get back to that. Coulter has also told Nikki Haley that she should go back to her home country, 
even though she was born in South Carolina. What's with the worshipping of the cows? They're all starving over there, and they're worshipping cows. Do you know they have a, 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 a rat temple where they worship rats? Hey, baby Kate, why don't you go back to your own country and reconsider that? J.D., to you, like, what does Ann Coulter's rejection of Ramaswamy and Nikki Haley and Indian Americans broadly, what does that say about the Republican Party? And at the same time, you know, Nikki Haley did fairly well, even though she has dropped out of the race. We continue to see people voting for her in primaries where she's appearing on the ballot. What does that say about where the Republican Party is at this moment in time to you? I think it's at a crossroads. The Republican Party needs to start understanding the demographics in the United States are changing. They're changing very fast. Because demographics are changing, it doesn't necessarily mean that new voters are automatically going to vote for Democrats. And seeing leaders like Nikki Haley, Vivek Ramaswamy, and Latino leaders, on the other hand, like Ted Cruz, says that there is a future for a more diverse Republican Party. I actually loved that you brought up Ted Cruz because you're absolutely right. It's like he doesn't get this kind of backlash, even though he has a Latino background. So it seems like there's or Marco Rubio. It seems like there's a a tacit acceptance of Latino Republicans and yet not necessarily of Indian American Republicans, despite the fact, you know, Nikki Haley goes by Nikki. Uh, She has converted to Christianity. I mean, she's, I guess, trying to fit into that WASP (laughs) uh, idea of America. Not that she needs to necessarily, but certainly she's tried. And and yet that seems to still not be enough for, for the likes of Ann Coulter. Right. And we would like to hear from the listeners. We would like to hear from you. Are Indian Americans who are part of the Republican Party internalizing racist, far-right values in order to fit in? Or do they have to bring their own brand of Indian Americanness? Yeah, and I, you know what? I think this question even goes beyond just Indian Americans who might identify with the Repub- Republican Party. But to be a part of the Republican Party, does it necessarily mean being anti-Indian? Because that's what that Ann Coulter piece kind of kind of says to me. As you mentioned, this identity of what Indian Americanness is, is changing as generations uh, grow. I mean, for example, we have the new generation, uh, Gen Zers, who are less interested in fitting in and more interested in sitting at the table. In Georgia, voters of tomorrow have endorsed a 24-year-old Democratic candidate, Ashwin Ramaswamy. I grew up in Johns Creek, Georgia, uh, which is in this district. I'm the child of immigrants. I was born, raised, and educated in the district in public schools. Who is running in uh, Georgia State Senate's 48th district. Ashwin Ramaswamy is running against a state senator, Sean Still, who was indicted in August of 2023 Uh, for signing certificates that falsely claimed Trump was the winner of Georgia's electoral vote in 2020. Elected in 2022, State Senator Sean Still is the only current elected official named in the 98-page indictment returned by Fulton. If Ashwin wins this general election, he will be the first Indian American state senator in Georgia and the youngest state senator in Georgia's history. But are Indian voters in Georgia ready for this Gen Z candidate? Time will tell. In the Georgia primary election, Ashwin received over 5,000 votes, a historically low voter turnout for any candidate in his district. Does Ashwin stand a good chance come November, especially when a third of his district is Asian? You know, Ashwin's campaign has been advocating for abortion rights, for lowering the cost of health care, for gun control and safety. These are all very, like, safe, standard, democratic kind of issues and talking points for the Democratic Party. And so he's definitely moving in that direction. Remember, this district is those suburbs outside of Atlanta, including the the town of Johns Creek, where there is this large Asian American population. He has not publicly engaged in any discourse involving Palestine, but I think that's probably reflective of the district where he's running, where this Republican, despite being indicted and having all of these democracy concerns, probably still stands a a fairly good chance uh, in a place like Georgia. So, Sarah, do you believe that Ashwin is representative of the Indian American voters? I mean, my sense is 
Yes, right? I mean, he might be alienating his demographic of Gen Z voters, like the Palestine issue. But at the same time, in a district, there's voters of all ages. And in fact, it's the older voters who typically are going to turn out more. He's likely playing to the demographic that's actually in the district. However, you know, it does pose a question of whether or not he may or may not ultimately end up alienating other Gen Z folks who may or may not be Indian American. Sarah, this was a great conversation. We had a lot of talking points. What is a stake if Indian voters are ignored in the 2024 election? Georgia presents this fascinating opportunity in the presidential campaign because of the Electoral College. And Indian Americans and people of color even more broadly can be the margin of difference in the outcome of the Georgia election. And so both Biden and Trump need to take that seriously. Uh, Kamala Harris can, of course, be a, a great advocate for Joe Biden. And I think it'll be a big question of how Trump is going to do that work to do outreach to the Indian American population of voters that are there as well, or to the broader Asian American community, which might be slightly different from some of those Indian Americans. We need to also remember that in 2020, we had record turnout nationwide. Um, can we count on Asian Americans to come out in, in, in such numbers again? Much to be seen. I mean, across the board, I think voters are nowhere near as excited about the 2024 election as they were in 2020. So, so much is at stake, but Indian Americans could be the margin of difference in Georgia. Uh, that's right. This election was decided by just 11,000 votes, and Indian Americans could be the deciding factor. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to continuing this conversation in our next episode. We hope you liked this episode. Nationly releases weekly on Thursdays on all streaming platforms. If you have thoughts you'd like to share with us, please email them to info at immigrantlypod.com or reach out on our socials at Immigrantly Media on Instagram and at Immigrantly underscore pod on X. And you can find me on X at J-U-A-N-D-R-47. And I'm at Sarah Sadwani on all the socials. Nationally is produced by Sadia Khan and Shay Yu. This episode is written by Andrea Flores and Daniela Tello Garzon with research assistance from Nicholas Black. Our sound designer and editor is Steve Martin. The Nationally theme music is by Simon Hutchinson. Additional music is by Epidemic Sound. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time. Ciao, ciao.